Turn on the sound system, please. Do you know how to turn on? Thanks. I forgot to. I don't have any announcements. I haven't even heard from Robin Cindy this week, so I assume they're doing just fine. Um, and no, I get no news is good news, I guess. Um, we're glad that you're all here. Are there are there announcements? I mean, I could make something up, but yeah, you know. it's pretty much on the back of the book. That's right. So look, you look at the back, you'll see everything that's coming up. Is it moving out here? There's something else. It just hit the power switch. There's a there's a power a plug on the top. If we get a few more people here, it might be helpful. See the see the <laughs> you see the plug the, where yes. everything plugs into? There you go. Thank you. Um, yeah. The uh, all the announcements are on the back. Um, we do have a fellowship. Will be downstairs. We have uh, air conditioning downstairs, and so we'll be good. And this one's up here, but it'll be a while. Loved ones, let's take a few moments to prepare ourselves in silence. <laughs> Uh, 
I invite you to stand as you are able and to join with me in the call to worship. Summer wanes and autumn draws close. Lord, help us to be ready for opportunities of service. We have felt the refreshment of time away. Lord, give us spirit for joy in time Come, let us celebrate God's eternal presence and love. Let us open our spirits to receive God's direction for our lives. Amen. Let us join together in singing hymn number 417, Christ has made the sure foundation.
lesson this morning comes from Psalm 34, verses 1 to 10. This is a psalm of David in praise for deliverance from trouble. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I saw the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all of my fears. Look to him, and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried, and was heard by the Lord, and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for those who fear him have no want. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Amen. Pray with me. Oh Lord our God, we come in the midst of so many things, laboring in many different fields, but in these moments we seek your word, we seek your spirit. Come to us, O oh Lord. Let us hear and know your will. For we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 
The gospel lesson today comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing by the, beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats on the shore of the lake. And the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down in the boat and began teaching the crowds from it. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were full to bursting. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were astounded at the catch of fish they had taken. Also with him were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their, brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's try it again. I know it's morning, and it's warm. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. It's good to read the Bible and to appreciate it. <laughs> It's been said that there are basically two types of people. Those who project themselves into the world and those who protect themselves from the world. And of all the ways we may characterize ourselves, none really rings truer than, than those two distinct possibilities. And what can be said of people can also be said of churches. A church can get all caught up in itself and simply glory in its own self-stimulation or it can get caught up in the needs of the world around it, engage in the concerns of the day, and seek to be an instrument of Christ's peace and power. In truth, a church isn't supposed to just sit around in a room talking about things uh, and how, it's, uh, how, how good it used to be. A church is supposed to be active, doing things and inviting others to, to join them. A church isn't supposed to be a, a museum for saints where we carefully protect ourselves, but a hospital for sinners, where all kinds of people find Christ healing and hope, which in turn produces a world of caring people. Consider the Bible lesson that I just read from you. We're going to go back to chapter 4. In chapter 4, it concludes with Luke, uh, with uh, Jesus teaching and preaching and performing miracles throughout Judea at the southern end of the Jordan River. Chapter 5 sees Jesus 100 miles away, Lake Gennesaret. What is Lake Gennesaret? Sea of Galilee. Very good had three different names, Lake Gennesaret, Sea of Galilee, and Lake of Tiberias. Here's a fun fact for you. A hundred miles away, between those two different towns, he's at the northern end of the Jordan. One morning, as he's walking along the shore, he is talking and teaching a group of people that just keeps growing. And as he walk, they're walking along, he sees two boats, he gets in one, asks them to put out from, to shore, from shore a little bit, and then starts teaching from the boat. Now those guys had been fishing all night and were trying to clean up their nets. 
They hadn't caught a thing. Imagine if a stranger walked up to you at the end of a long work day and commandeered your car so that you couldn't go home and said, you know, you can have it in just a minute. Let, take me over here so I can speak to these people. You know, we would try to humor the person just to get rid of them. And then only realizing that they're just getting started as they, as they move away. We wouldn't be happy. We'd be trying to figure out how to call the police. The men had worked all night and Ted caught nothing. It was not a good day. Even so, said Jesus, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Imagine what those experienced fishermen must have thought. They knew exactly what they were doing. It was their job every day. And then some guy wanders up and says, go over there and let down your nets. But then we read and we heard, and when they had done this, they enclosed a great shoal of fish so full that their nets were breaking and they had to beckon to others in the other boat. And they filled them both. The story, that story, is suggestive of how we look at life. Caught up in the same old way of doing things, consumed with ourselves and our prerogatives, we seem to trudge from one productive day to another. And then Jesus comes along and says, put out into the deep. Go where you haven't gone before. Plunge into the job you've been avoiding. Renew a friendship you've neglected. Let go of a grudge. Take part in the events going on around you. As we project ourselves into the world with those kinds of interests, we find that a, a whole new opportunity opens up in front of us. Put out into the deep. We all know the world is changing. The Pew Research Center studies the spiritual beliefs and practices of people. And, oh gosh, three, at least three years ago, they, they designated the new largest growing faction. They were called the nuns. Because when asked about faith or religion, affiliation, they simply said none. And a lot of reasons were given, but the basic rationale is the physical universe is all there is. There is no God, no ultimate truth, no cosmic justice. Therefore, I am free to do whatever I want. We may fully believe that Jesus uh, is the fullness of God and was pleased to dwell um, with us. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile himself to all people. But sadly... We will never, ever have proof. You see, proof requires facts. If we look at the universe, we can describe it with science and facts. Facts come from common sense, science, technology, and deal with the physical universe, the speed of light, the distance from Pasadena to San Francisco. We live on the third rock from the sun. We can agree on facts. Faith or belief, on the other hand, is about ultimate reality. Anything that may exist outside the physical universe. Does anything exist outside the physical universe? I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows. Does God exist? If you believe, yes, there is a God, that is your faith, but you do not have proof. For an atheist, the answer is no, there is no God. That is their faith. They do not have proof. Nobody does. We all have faith. Everyone, everywhere, including us, atheists, nuns, everyone. It's just different. Moreover, ultimate reality may exist within the physical universe. But if you want to recognize it, 
to identify it as beyond the universe and part of an ultimate reality, you have to use faith. You cannot use science and facts to describe ultimate reality. It can't be done. I'm not, this is not new stuff. These ideas have been around since the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, and they've continued to grow. So for the last five centuries, increasing numbers of people have been looking more and more to science and technology for answers, unless we, people of faith, have proof for them. But we don't. And of course, they don't have proof for anything that they think God. So what do we do? Put out into the deep, says Christ. There is no area where our thinking, talking, and praying shouldn't go to work. And in the church of Jesus Christ, where there are all kinds of people with all kinds of views, we can learn from each other to seek the mind of Christ. Christ doesn't want us all clamped into into one small mold. Look at the New Testament. There were, there were spiritual people, you know, were <clears throat> mystics, like John. There were, there were theologians who liked to spell it out in every detail, like Paul. There were activists, like James, who were most concerned about putting their faith into action. Jesus calls each of us, all of us, to use our different types of, of personality and Christian experience to enrich each other. What might happen if we, on Christians everywhere, put out into the deep? This much is certain. When we stop protecting ourselves, and start projecting ourselves into the world, new insights come and fresh energy flows. For Jesus is God in our midst. God meeting us where we are. God entering our struggles. God taking on himself our sin. God delivering us, saving us. God calling us to sacrifice for one another to love one another as he has loved us. God giving us a new outlook, a new source of stability and strength. God saying, put out into the deep. Is God saying anything to you? If what we are doing and the way we are living is comfortable and easy and expected, God may be saying to you, put out into the deep. Putting out into the deep may feel uncomfortable, be unbelievable, and seem nearly impossible because we are familiar with our surroundings and our lives. But after Christ got hold of those fishermen, they had more fish than they knew what to do with. After Christ gets hold of us as individuals, families, business people, neighbors, citizens, volunteers, supporters, church folk, our lives take on qualities we didn't even know were there before. When Martha and I were looking to buy a house, we were living in Denton, Texas, and we went to the First State Bank of Texas. And in the waiting area, they had a little, a little magazine called The Four Times. In that edition that I read as we waited, they told about a farmer who bought a Model T Ford in 1909. But the farmer and his wife didn't know what to do with it after they bought it or where to put it. They didn't want to put it in the barn because it might get scratched and rust away. They didn't want to leave it outside because they knew the weather would abuse it. So, they put it in their parlor. And the Ford Motor Company says it's true. And it sat in their parlor for 40 years. Of course, the farmer had not intended to leave it in the parlor, but he did want to protect the Ford. 
And once he got the notion of protecting it, he became afraid to take it out of the parlor. The car was cleaned and dusted every week and treated as you would a, a piece of priceless furniture. In due time, the, the farmer gave up the idea of wanting to learn how to drive anyway. He didn't need it on his farm. And then the couple died. And when the household furnishings were auctioned off, that Ford was bought for $37 by two boys who probably did not polish it anymore and who most certainly did not keep it in their parlor. Wouldn't it have been great to be one of those two young people? You know, imagine how they made that car go. And when it was put into its use, it found its real purpose. Even though it was just a tin Lizzie, it wasn't meant to be sitting in a parlor. It was meant to be going places. That story is a picture of how we can protect ourselves. There are those who would preserve the church as the farmer preserved his Ford in the parlor. They would keep it from the, the rough wear and tear which the world brings with it. We can do that with our faith, too. Carefully preserved, manicured and polished, groomed and dressed. We protect our lives and our part from the demands our faith puts on us. And like the Ford in the parlor, the real self and the real faith become useless, even though they look so nice. Put out into the deep, says Jesus. Identify me where you are, says Christ. Put yourself in my hands and know that I am with you always. Let my spirit kindle your spirit and know that as you become involved with your brothers and sisters here on earth, you will not only find life abundant, you will begin to taste life eternal. In the words of the hymn, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all, we trust and obey. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have blessed us and helped us. Now we pray for the courage to put out into the deep in whatever form it takes. It will be different, we know. And help us to support each other as we all try to be faithful to your word and call. For we ask all of it in your name. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join with singing in me, Spirit of the Living God.
Yes. My daughter Paula has been diagnosed with a cold disc after a long time of getting diagnosed. So she's home trying to work through that with two of you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers. Um, we would ask for prayers for the Flack family yesterday. Twan and I participated in a memorial service for Terry. Uh, he died a couple months ago, five months ago, uh, from lung cancer, uh, having never smoked a day in his life. Um, but always it's a great loss for his wife, his children, and his grandchildren. Uh, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. My friends, let us pray. God of all compassion, in Jesus Christ you lay claim to our entire selves and show us that nothing is too grand or insignificant for your mercy to touch. Therefore, we are bold enough to lift our prayers to you this morning. We give you thanks for the goodness that overflows in our lives, for this beautiful planet, so powerful and yet so fragile, and in need of our care and restoration. We give you thanks for sunsets and sunrises as they move across the skies according to the seasons, for family, friends, and loved ones around us, for little ones and not so little ones returning to school, for the sweetness of the last produce from our gardens and the green citrus waiting for its time to ripen. We ask you for your healing and grace for those places that are broken in the world and in our lives, for nations plagued by warfare and souls plagued by shame, for people without food and people without friendship, for your loved ones in hospitals, domestic violence shelters, and refugee camps. Purify our faith, O oh God, that it may bear fruit in this world. Send forth your church that we may care for your people in distress. Give us faith, O oh God, like Jesus' followers, to throw out our nets on the other side of what makes us uncomfortable. We pray all this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just as we have received the, the gift of turning to God in prayer and lifting up our joys and concerns, we are also gifted with the opportunity to share what we have received from God's generosity, to share with others and to help those in the world.
invitation. Generous God, we return to you these gifts, not only of our resources, but also of our lives. Sanctify us and use us to work out your purposes in the world. Amen. My friends, this is the great feast that our Lord prepared for us. This is a gift that nourishes the body and spirit. It brings our lives together and makes it whole. There's no greater miracle that we enjoy as Christians. This is so amazing that we get this. And there are no barriers here to your participation. If you claim Jesus as your Lord, this table, this feast are for you. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And you have come to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and given us this meal. These elements symbols of a different possibility in our lives, an ultimate reality in the midst of our daily life. We pray, O oh God, that your spirit will be upon us as we share. Help us to recognize you wherever we are and in other people. There is so many opportunities for us to, to witness your goodness, your strength, your beauty, your love, and your grace. Help us to recognize these things wherever we are as we express the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your most holy spirit upon us and upon these gifts. May they infuse us with an awareness of your love, fill us with a, the knowledge of your grace that forgives us and restores us. May we see ourselves as you see us, beloved children of God, and not as the images of ourselves that we have and hold. Bless each one of us that we may continue to serve you in all possible ways. As we pray all of this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. On the night that he was arrested, Jesus sat at table with his disciples. And he took the bread that was there and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same manner, Jesus picked up an empty cup off the table. And after giving thanks, he poured into it, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink from this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he comes again.
friend, this is the bread of heaven. God, the cup of salvation poured out for you. Please join together in the prayer of thanksgiving printed in your programs. Gracious God, we, we thank, thank you that in this sacrament you assure, assure us of your goodness and love. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and help us to grow in love and obedience, that we may serve you in the world and finally be brought to that table for all your saints' feasts of you forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 505, Be Known to Us in the Breaking of the Bread. opportunity to to remember and to give thanks for all those who do so many things for us from all the food that we enjoy all of the gifts that we have remember and give thanks loved ones remember live simply love generously serve faithfully speak truthfully pray daily and leave everything else up to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you now and always. Amen.